Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this blessed day, for being able to observe the beauty of your creations, however big, however small, however <laughs> it is that we must share with them and sometimes get frustrated, but they are your creation as well as we are. Bless us this day, help us as we study your word and as we learn from it. And what we learn, may it help us make decisions as you guide us through your word. We pray this in Christ's name, amen. 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 All right, questions? About when, yes, Brian. Yes, uh, when the king puts Daniel in the uh, lines, then he's, he's upset with it. But then he goes back to the palace and says he fasts. He fast. And that's almost like a sacrifice to our, I mean, I guess what is the purpose of that fast? I can see he's upset and he didn't want to eat, but it does say he withholds food. And is that because of us, is he making a sacrifice to uh, Yahweh? Or, or, you know, because then he's, he's running back. He has some kind of faith that this, that Daniel's going to be, be saved. And he goes, rushes there in the morning. So I guess what was the reason of that fast being in there? Do, do we know? Or? Okay, we'll, we'll talk about that. It's on my list. We'll make sure we can. <clears throat> yes, Kathy. So I was a project manager in my former life, which is probably why I get caught up in the detail of things. But I was curious. <laughs> They, they mentioned twice that he prayed three times a day. Is that is there a significance to that? Or is it just making sure you understood that he was praying regularly? I'm probably going to let Val answer that one. Um. Well, you know, I, I looked that up earlier. John, that's the prayer, the Jewish prayer book requires right. three prayers a day. The Siddur or Siddur. Yeah. Yeah. So... Okay, and we'll we'll talk more about that. Um, so, uh, what else? What else in here? Uh, I'll go to Val, and then I'll go to Paul. If I understood what I read correctly, the other whatever they were with Daniel, who are against Daniel, went to the king and told him that they were going to. They wanted him to say that he was God. Yes. And I don't understand why he went along with that because he seemed to be so sympathetic to Daniel and he wanted, and he seemed to have enough faith in Daniel's, the God that Daniel was worshiping to believe that that God was going to save Daniel. So I don't understand why he didn't just say, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, we'll talk about um, we'll talk about that. Uh, Paul, is it uh, isn't it surprising that there's a den of lions available to use? Is that is that something, <laughs> something that you expect to be there? <laughs> ah, good. I'd never thought about that. <laughs> you don't have one. Um, no, then it's squirrels. Oh, just squirrels. <laughs> yeah, somehow it wouldn't have the same impact. Throw them in the den of squirrels. <laughs> it happens in, in, in Charlie and the Chalk Factory, in the book anyway. Baruch oh, Assault okay. gets pulled down by the squirrels. So, <laughs> Oh, yeah. What else? What other questions? Brian. Hang on up. Uh, there's these three presidents, and I would assume the other two are corrupt because uh, Daniel's performing the best out of the three. So he's yeah. not taking a cut or whatever. And so these two, I think, you know, I just want to get them out of the picture. But the, the moral is, you know, kind of that he serves his king in his capacity the best he can, but he also serves his God and, and serves both. And is that the story we're supposed to take from this, that you got to remember who's first, I guess, but you can almost serve two masters here in a way, as long as you keep God your first master. Is that a... Right. And, and that, that's part of the, the complex nature of this story, 
right? I mean, there, there can be a, a, a simple explanation for this story, mm -hmm. but if we mine it for more, I think you're right, Brian. That, that's a, I think that's an integral part of perhaps what we ought to take from this story. But, and so we'll be sure to talk about that. That's a, that's a great question. Charlotte. Oh no, I'm sorry, I thought I had. Did I see another hand someplace? Look around. No. All right, so let's, let's begin where I always begin with Daniel. And a reminder, this is just a story. <laughs> this is just a story. Um, again, thinking about Jesus who tells things like the Good Samaritan and the Running Father parables, story to, to guide, direct, encourage. Um, and so what that means is Darius, who was actually a Mede, but was not Persian. Um, Darius, who was king of the Medes, actually had uh, 12. Historically, we know he had 12 governors. Okay, not 120, but you know, it's a great story. Let's ramp this up. We'll multiply the number by 10. Um, and don't know about three presidents. We do know that he had like three or er, er, 12 areas that he governed, that governed his empire. Um, And again, you know, what's interesting is that this refers to Daniel as Daniel doesn't refer to him by his Babylonian name or some sort of other name, but we're back to Daniel. And, it, and, and so let's talk about the setup of the story. Okay. Because th this, is, this is a story well told. Okay. It's been carefully crafted. How does it begin? What, what's the first thing that sort of sets up the story? Now, and by the way, what's interesting is that from that, that the new leader, if you will, according to these stories that are linked together, that Darius would choose <clears throat> Daniel, who was an advisor to the former king whom he defeated as one of his leaders. So that's sort of the first, actually, that's probably the first great miracle of this story, if you want to think of it that way. You know, that he, he gets held over from one administration to the next. <laughs> um, but it, it, it makes the story. Without it, we wouldn't have the story. All right. So Daniel gets held over, and what do we learn, or what are we reminded of? And Daniel, and by the way, what what the, the the whole setup of this is that it 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 can circulate as an independent story. It doesn't need any of the other stories to 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 sort of live on its own. Right, we learn everything anew about Daniel. It doesn't say, "Well, you remember in the last story, in the last episode." <clears throat> it's it it's so. What do we learn about Daniel to set the story, Mary? Well, mine says that he was so outstanding that the king was thinking about putting him in charge of everything. Right. So that would get rid of the other two presidents, I guess, and then they were jealous. So. Right. So right. So he's again. Just like the battle of the vegetables, he's the best, he's the brightest. He is the extraordinary one, right? He's cream of the crop. Um, there's some song about that from the 30s. I don't know. Anyway, cream of the crop. Um, and why is he the cream of the crop? In verse three. Spirit was with him. Right, right. There was an excellent spirit within him, right? It's not just because Daniel um, was Superman. It was because there is the spirit of God is within him. 
and that's what does it. So again, all all the credit here is is going to God, right? He's superior <laughs> because the Spirit is with him. All right. Um, <coughs> right, and as Mary said, the conflict, you know, every good story, right, has a setup and a conflict. <laughs> Stories without conflict are pretty boring, all right? So the conflict, as Mary said, happens when, you know, the king's like, well, <laughs> you're better than everybody else, so I'll make you number numero uno. Um, right, and so what makes the story, what ramps up the, the conflict in the story? What, what are the, so they want to get rid of him, right? The other presidents and satraps want to get rid of him. What's the problem with that? Jealousy. Right, no, they're jealous. They can't find anything. They can't find any dirt on him. Right, right. They can't find anything he's done wrong. Yep. Yep, there's no uh, laptop left behind. There's no, uh, you know, there's, there's nothing that's there um, for them to find anything wrong with it. But not only that, um, they also aren't able to corrupt him. Right. Yes. John, can you can you look at this? Really, basically, he's following Torah in a way. He's following the, the Ten Commandments. Being a good Jew, he's not stealing. He's respect, you know. And by doing so, the spirits within him, and you know, you, you wouldn't be corrupt if you really totally followed the. I would assume the Ten Commandments. Where these other two, it looks like now they jealous jealous of them. I think it goes more than that. It's survival ship. It's me first. I'm going to lose my. If they're corrupt. They're taking a cut or whatever. That's why the, Daniel's all performing them. And they're worried about their survival. But I agree, the only way they can get them is by concocting this conspiracy thing. Or... Right. And so, yeah, so they can't find anything. And, mm -hmm. and we're not sure what their, their motives just seem to be jealousy. They're afraid of losing their positions. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right that, that Daniel, and so the setup, let's think more about the setup. The setup is that Daniel is the good Jew who refuses to compromise, right? And we're going to watch that refusal to compromise more as we move through the story. But you're absolutely right that he could have enriched himself. He could have cheated. He could have stolen. Um, but he doesn't. He follow, as you, That's a great observation. He follows Torah. And he does what good Jews are supposed to do. And by the way, which is one of the reasons in, in the Persian Empire anyway, uh, Jews were often in positions of high authority within the Persian government because hmm. um, they could be trusted, you know? And, and so throughout, and actually even up until the 1930s in Baghdad and elsewhere, Jews were actively involved in the government. They were well-trusted. Um, they had a great reputation. So, so right. So he is that, that the kind of Jew that all Jews should be. Okay. The kind of Hebrew, all Hebrews should be. All right. So now, um, so verse five. So they can't find it in him specifically. So where are they, what are they going to turn against him? Right? Because so far it's a pretty boring story, right? They're jealous, but they can't do anything. But, but now what are they going to use against Daniel? God's law. Right. God's law. It's like, okay. Now, and is, is Brian, back to your point. If he's a being obedient completely to God's law all the time, then we have to figure out a way to use it against him. We have to turn his strength into a weakness. And, and actually, I think as we move through this story, I'll, I'll also relate this to um, the time of Antiochus, the fourth Epiphanes. And, and so Daniel becomes the faithful Jew 
okay? And any Jew under Antiochus who was found with a copy of Torah, even a copy of it was put to death. Mm -hmm. um, Antiochus's forces spread throughout the land. They tried to burn every copy of Torah. They tried to uh, kill anyone who had one, um, destroyed synagogues, you know. And, and so the, the fact here that the word is turned against you would have been something faced by those who were first reading this compilation of the, of the Daniel stories. All right. So now, and this was, uh, I think, Brian's question, or one of it, someone's question. Um, what's their plan? Val. Well, they, they knew or they kind of assumed that Daniel would not be willing to worship any other god. And so they, um, they talked to the king and, and asked him to declare himself god. And mm -hmm. then they, they would be able to um, prosecute Daniel because he wouldn't worship the, the king god. Right. What do you guys think of that? What's anything funny, odd strike you about that for any reason? Yeah, well, Kathy. I, th I think it's weird that they had to go to the king to suggest that he do this. And he, because if, if he wanted to, he could have done it on his own a long time ago. Yeah. So it's weird to me that they would go to him and say, hey, got this great idea. Thought you might want to try. And he goes along with it as opposed to why didn't he think of that on his own to do it? Right. It feeds, it feeds his vanity. I and mean, it's like saying, hey, you should declare that oh, people should only worship you for 30 days. I think that really appealed to his vanity. Hey, okay, sounds good. You know. Right. Uh, Carl and then Val. I'm surprised that he didn't see right through it. <laughs> I, that's a great that's a great point, but it makes for a better story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but that's right. Didn't see right through it. Uh, Val and then Brian. Well, it was, my original question was, why did the king go along with it? But I think, um, was it Mary who said his vanity? You know, that, that does make sense, a certain amount of sense to me. Although I do think the king was a more... Um, Oh, that's the word I'm looking for. I, I think he had more um, integrity than that and to let them appeal to his vanity in that way. And I especially think it because he seemed to really care about Daniel. I mean, he, he really, mm -hmm. um, he was concerned about him being condemned to the lion's den. He, he couldn't sleep or anything that night because he was so concerned about him and he rush to open the den up, like first right. thing. So I, it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, but anyhow. Yeah, okay, Brian. So I just the whole thing was on his radar. <clears throat> you know, the king, he gets trapped in that, but he, go, he doesn't really probably understand that uh, the complete Torah or what Daniel has to do to keep his faith. So I oh. think he kind of got trapped into there, like they say, and then once he realizes he, puts the law down now he's he was trapped in a conspiracy that uh he just didn't see it coming and then then he does feel re a lot of regret that he did it yeah. and but he has no way out well, and we get caught in that in life too a lot of times we don't really think ahead well, there were two steps ahead of him he was one step behind kind of right so uh julie you're muted Um, maybe I'm making too big a deal of this, but it's interesting because the presidents say um, to Darius, all the presidents of the kingdom and the prefects and the satraps and the counselors and the governors are agreed that you should establish an ordinance. And, you know, they're speaking for Daniel there. It doesn't seem like he would have been a part of that decision making. 
Yeah, correct. It's it's all minus one. <laughs> yeah. Yes, John. You mentioned at first that it looks like, you know, this chapter's out, set by itself. We don't get any background. Um, I think the satraps and the presidents must have already known because they recommended the Den of Lions instead of a furnace, and they knew a furnace wouldn't work. <laughs> That's right. So what this time? Let's let's figure this out. What's what what can we use this time? Right. So, yes, Mary Gold. What is the this little edict had a little clause in it that said for thirty days. I mean, does that mean you could go along for 29 and abuse this thing and then on the 30th day sort of forget to worship and then start your clock again? What was the purpose of 30 days? That it had to be well documented? I, you know, I, I can't, I can't say for certain. Brian, did you look it up? No, but I'm thinking it was permanent then, Dan, you know, it's kind of like a little, hey, you just got to not follow the rules for just a short period of time, you know, mm -hmm. and we all would like to take that excuse for a lot of things. And I think the short period of time means, well, Dan, you know, Daniel, if he just would do it for that short, and he's clear of that. So I think that, you know, it's an enticing thing instead, but you're right. I mean, when I saw that's what I was thinking, I, it was forever, then Daniel, you know, had no choice. But if he just broke the rules for a little bit of time, he, he was in the clear, but in God's eyes, he wouldn't have been in the clear. But I like that. Yeah. So just for a short period of time. I like that, Brian. Mary. Or even if he had closed his window and did it in secret, you know, he would still be, he would still be, you know, following Torah, but he wouldn't open himself up to get caught. So, I mean, this reminds me of, of Esther, because the same thing happens in mm -hmm. Esther. The king has an edict to kill the Jews. And when he finds out, you know, you can't take it back. So maybe it's something in the story, or maybe it's some kind of Persian thing that, you know, once the king makes a law, he can't go back and undo it. I don't know. All right. So let's, let's, let's talk about reality and then the story. We'll, we'll do a little reality check here. First, the reality check is no king in this period of time in their right mind would have ordered people only to worship them and not the other gods. That would have been disastrous for their civilization, okay? Because the kings of Media and Persia, all when they were ordained, crowned, whatever, they pledged themselves to Ahura Mazda, which was the great god, and then often to lesser gods. And so the thought of even spending 30 days not worshiping Ahura Mazda, um, this, is, this is not good. Um, and so one, they never would have done it. And, and the, only, the only kings that I am aware of who actually wanted themselves to be worshipped uh, were the Ptolemaic pharaohs. Um, the Ptolemies were Greeks who had conquered Egypt. And when you go to Egypt, you see all of these temples dedicated to the Ptolemies and they're adorned with uh, the Egyptian gods. <laughs> Sorry, godding them, <laughs> doing whatever you do to make someone a god um, of the Ptolemies. Theophi, thank you. Um, other than that, no one in the Persian Empire, the, you know, they ruled the Persian Empire, but they understood that, that they weren't gods. None of them claimed to be gods. So, so this would have been totally out of character in, in, in any way uh, in, in the real world. Um, and, and maybe that's part of the point is just to show how far this king, you know, no offense. I just read this and it's like this king is uh, yep, yep, sure, I'll do that. <laughs> you know, just make me, uh, just worship me for 30 days. And, you know, like, really, really. So it, in that sense, it's a, it, it, it shows the foolishness 
-hmm. of the king. Right. So you're reading this story and there are other parts, but you're looking at like, oh, this guy just he's 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 really not that bright. All right. Now, and the other thing is about the law of the Medes and Persians. Nowhere, nowhere in any of the records or annals of any of these civilizations is there something called the law of the Medes and the Persians. Oh. Um, a king could make one decision one day and uh, another decision the next. Th there was no immutable um, law. It just wasn't. Um, kind of like the session at the church. They can make one decision one day and another decision the next day. Um, there's no immutable law. Al although I've met people at churches that have said, no, we made a decision. We can't ever change it. So, but, but it makes for a great story. Why does it make for a great story? The law of the Medes and Persians. Val. Well, it makes it seem like he, he doesn't have an option. He doesn't have any, any other choice. He has to follow the law. Exactly. Exactly. That, that the king who favors Daniel is now trapped. Mm -hmm. Okay. He's trapped by his own words and by his own decision. And you notice that he's reminded of this. <laughs> you know, he, he is reminded of this by all of the satraps. Oh, we know you like Daniel, but guess what? <laughs> you can't change your mind now. All right. Um, so. All right, so now we have the law of the Medes and Persians can't be changed. They, everybody has to worship only Darius for 30 days. And again, as someone said, what does Daniel do? He continues he, on worshiping his God. Yeah, yeah, okay. he continues worshiping his God. Three times a day. <laughs> and not only does he worship three times a day, where does he do it? Yeah, front of the, the window. Hey, y'all, look, look, <laughs> look, where I am. <laughs> you know, I'm worshiping my God. What you going to do about it? Right? And, and so this is that idea of Faithfulness. So, so think about this. And if there's a theme that runs through Daniel, right? It's this theme of faithfulness. Um, we're not going to eat your food. We're going to be faithful to our God. Um, we're not going to bow down to the statue. We're only going to worship our God. Um, we're we're not going to only worship this this king. We're going to be faith. You know, there's this deep running theme. Of faithfulness. All right. So now they accuse him. They bring they bring the charges, and and it's obvious to everybody that he's broken the law of Medes and Persians. But look at and, and something that sort of jumped out at me in verse thirteen. How do they refer to him? An exile from Judah. What does that say to you that they bring that up? Because nowhere else here has <clears> that been brought up. Well, he's not one factor? of us. Mm. Right. Right. He's not one of us. He's an outsider. He's a foreigner. He's mm. one of those people. Right. And, and it, uh, that's often what we, we do with people. Well, they're not one of us. Mm -hmm. You know, why should we listen to them? They're a foreigner. 
and and it others them. Okay, so not only has he broken the law, but he's he's one of them. He's one of those people. All right. Now, interestingly enough, then, what do we find out about the king? Not happy. Yeah, he's not happy. Not just is he not happy. He's distressed. Which is what he should have been. <clears throat> right so it's it's sort of fascinating that this guy catches a break <laughs> in the story which i would argue uh thinking again about the time of antiochus that this is what the the antiochus the fourth epiphanes this is the way he should have reacted to the Jews under his charge, because the Jews under his charge were honest, they were faithful, they were helpful, they tried to be good citizens, they had actually prayed for him every day. And this is something, by the way, that begins in, in, the, in the Babylonian exile, is that the Jews prayed for all the nations who held them captive. They prayed for the Babylonians, they prayed for the Persians, they prayed for the Greeks, Ultimately, they'll pray for the Romans. The, one of the reasons that Judaism was allowed to be a separate religion was that they made the promise that they would daily offer sacrifices at the temple in Jerusalem for the emperor, the Roman emperor. So this was a practice. And so Antiochus should have seen this and should have responded just like Darius. That when bad things started to happen to the Jews, Antiochus should have been concerned. All right. Um, which then brings us to what does the king do next? I mean, he has. So think about what he does next. Uh, John. Well, there's two things here, I think. The first one is, this is another one of those glitches in the story. The king said, you know, the, the laws of the Medes and the Persians, well, wait a minute, I'm a god now, I can do whatever I want. So I'm not going to put this guy in the lion's den, but he didn't do that. And then when he, interestingly enough, when he went to get Daniel, he brought Daniel before him and asked Daniel, uh, said that he hoped Daniel's God would save him. Right. Right, so he is sympathetic to Daniel <clears throat> and feels really badly about this. Okay. But he's locked in. Law of Medes and Persians, not even, not even as that one to be worshipped. Can he change the law? So he's trapped. Brian. One thing he doesn't show here, which I, it happens later, but you know, he should be a little angry too that he got put in this trap. And for the other two presidents, yet... You know, he could have done anything he wanted to them at this point in time. We see at the end that they get their come up or whatever. But, but he he does feel right uh, concerned about Daniel, which is I guess maybe where his concern should be. But I would think he'd be a little angry that that he got trapped and uh, put in this position. This is going to cost him. He knows that in the long run. Right, and and so he does the only thing he can do, which is he fasts and prays. Okay. That's it. That's all he can do now. Well, who's he praying to, though? Do you think he's praying to Daniel's God? Um, actually, it doesn't say pray. It says he just no. fasted. So he fasts, but you would assume he's praying. So he's praying okay. to the gods, Ahura Mazda, maybe other oh, gods. Who knows? Okay. But he's okay. fasting. He's being, and fasting is part of repentance. Okay? You fast okay. in repentance. So in some ways, he's in engage in an act of repentance all right now what's interesting is yes when in verse 14 he's distressed and he does everything he tries to find a way out 
spends oh, yeah. a whole day doing this. Try, you know, I imagine him trying to figure out how can I get around this ego? Is there a loophole somewhere? And then the conspirators come after this and, and they really put they really put the pressure on him there. Mm -hmm. And you know, he's he's caught. He's he's trapped just as Daniel is trapped. Absolutely. Yes. And that's part of what makes this story so powerful is that there's no way out. He can't change his mind. He can't find a loophole. And they remind him there are no loopholes. And the cons I, I imagine the conspirators just being so pleased with themselves that we oh, got yeah. you. Yeah. Yep, we got both of you. Which, in some ways, if you think about, that's the Greeks. We got you. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to do away with the Jews. You know, it's like the law of the Medes and Persians. We're the Greeks, and we're going to take care of you guys because you're going to be faithful. And because you're going to be faithful, we're going to exterminate you. Right? This is, they're, they're playing the part of the Greeks. All right. Okay. Um, so, in 19, uh, break of day. Now, what's interesting is the, the law of the Medes and Persians obviously doesn't give, uh, doesn't say you have to have an extended stay in the lion's den. <laughs> you know, he, he only stays in the lion den, lion's den overnight. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so at the break of day, he, he runs and he cries out anxiously. I love that. That's just, oh, Daniel, servant of the living God. For them, all gods were living. Living God has your God, whom you faithfully serve, been able to deliver you from the lions. He probably could have just looked in. But, you know, he has to make the pronouncement. And then what's... How does Daniel respond? This is interesting. Oh, King, live forever. Yeah. Uh, he doesn't blame the king. You know? My God sent his angel, shut the lion's mouth so they would not hurt me, because I was found blameless before him and also before you, oh, king, I have done no wrong. Wow. No, no great humility there. Uh -oh. But it's part of the story. Mm -hmm. Right? It's like Job. You know, the story of Job starts off saying that Job's the perfect guy. He did everything right. He did nothing wrong. And, and Job protests his innocence throughout the book. All right. What's the king's response then? He gets rid of the accusers and their families. Right. First, he gets Daniel out. Um, and notice, so Daniel was taken out of the den and no kind of harm was found in him because why? <laughs> he trusted in God. Right. Now, unfortunately, under Antiochus IV, lots of Jews who trusted in God, the lions got them, <laughs> literally and figuratively. And yet, this is a story that says, regardless of the possibilities, one ought to trust in God. But then the part of the story that we don't teach children in Sunday school. You know, we always, I grow, oh, Daniel and Lyons said, isn't this great? But no, none of my teachers said, well, then they threw the other people in, along with their families and their children. Um, before they reach the bottom of the den, <laughs> the Lions are like outfielders. It's mine. You know, here it comes. I'll, I'll grab it on the way down. 
Um, and so judgment is instantaneous. <clears throat> right? This is justice. No mercy here. This is just pure justice. Um, and then what does Dur Yes, Mary. Well, at the beginning, it said the king was thinking about making um, Daniel the only, only um, president. And it turns out that way at the end because the other two got, got thrown in the lion's den. So the king got what he wanted in the end. Right, um, but it, but what's interesting is nowhere does um, does it say. It just says he prospered during the reign of Darius and then the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Um, but yeah, it's obvious that all the others are gone. You know, they've all been eaten by the lions, so Daniel's the only one left. Um, But who, but who gets all the credit here? The God of Daniel. Yeah. The Jews. Yeah, the God of Daniel, the God of the Jews. It's not tremble and, and listen to Daniel because he's now the only president that's left. It is that you should tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. Meaning, if you're reading this story in the time of Antiochus IV Epiphanes, who should be trembling before the God of the Jews? Antiochus. Yeah. Um, and then you get this um, great poem to God. Mm -hmm. Living God enduring forever, his kingdom shall never be destroyed, his dominion has no end, delivers and rescues, works signs and wonders. He saved Daniel from the power of the lions. Right? And yes, uh, Julie, did you have something? Sorry. Um, anyway, so Daniel prospers. All right, so let's think about this. What, what are the lessons? Because there's more than one. Right. So what are the lessons? What did you take? What do you take from this story? Yeah, Val. For me, the, the strongest lesson uh, was to stay true to your faith. Okay. No matter what, um, that. No, nothing was going to cause Daniel to veer from his beliefs. And, um, and that's pretty powerful. Yeah. Um, okay. Yes. Faithfulness. It, it is that theme that runs through all these stories and is certainly in this story. Brian. Uh, I probably fall more into the King's uh, lifestyle than Daniel's because Daniel's almost perfect in the story and I'm not perfect but what I bring from this is uh, getting trapped in life and, you know and it brings me to the New Testament when Jews hear these stories how Jesus oh. can't hear you yeah I can't hear you Brian you muted yourself here we go I'm sorry <laughs> I says uh, I, I would I don't know if you heard earlier, Pop, but I was, uh, you know, I would relate to the king more than Daniel in my life. And then, you, you know, because we always have these traps set before us. And then uh, because of our pride and all our, you know, so we're vulnerable to being trapped. But when Jesus in the New Testament is trying to be trapped, we look at him as more, but he's also God. He sees those traps coming a, a mile away and he never answers the question. Yes. Give the money to. Uh, well, he does answer the question about Caesar, you know, who's on the money, it's, give it to him. But most of the time he answers with a question. And then it's a teachable moment for us in the New Testament because Jesus then also shows us, you know, why, uh, uh, you know. So 
so I kind of get from the story uh, personally is, uh, you know, watch out for the traps that come at us and let's look at our faith and what we're supposed to do. And then maybe ask some questions or something before we say yes. Yeah. So uh, I like that. Fun. Yeah. I mean, that that we can be trapped by our pride. Mm -hmm. yes. Absolutely. I like that. Who else? What else? In here. Yes, Val. This just kind of popped into my mind as you were saying that. I think we can also be trapped by fear because if Daniel was more fearful of the punishment, then if that fear outweighed his belief in God, he, he could have capitulated. But Absolutely. Yeah. So, and I think we as humans get trapped by fear a lot. We we make our dis make decisions out of fear of failure, fear of other people's opinions. I mean, on and on and on. Um, yeah. Yeah. What else? I think in some ways this is a, a gold mine of uh, thoughts. Swid. Going back to your notes and dealing with the concept of civil disobedience. Yes. And I couldn't help but think of the civil disobedience that occurred during the Vietnam War and people, people of faith that I personally know who were arrested during that time, but they were, you know, they were expressing their, their views based upon what their faith had taught them. Mm -hmm. People right. that there were people that refused to pay their tax, the war portion of the war tax during that yep. time. Yep. Liz. Um, I was thinking about how easy it is to compromise when you're put in a spot and Daniel didn't. And <coughs> yeah. It reminds me that we should be careful not to conform to the world the things, but stay transformed. Right, to quote the Apostle Paul. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by Christ. Yep. Absolutely. What, what else? Yeah, and as I, just one of the things, as I said in my notes, that this is also a contest between whose laws are eternal. You know, human beings think they can make eternal laws, but mm -hmm. ultimately it's only God's law that is eternal. You know, that it's, it, it is that it, it is the God that sets the bar um, and not human beings. Our laws come and go. You know, Code of Hammurabi at one point was something, but we don't live by the Code of Hammurabi anymore. Um, so, um, anything else coming out of this? Yes, Mary. Well, now I have a question. Okay. As Christians, in the huge whatever that means word, how do we determine what laws are eternal? It seems to me, as I deal with family members, my husband's family, um, that they perceive a number of things as God's law, which I do not perceive. So, how how did the, how did that happen? I mean, can we all have different views of what laws are eternal, especially when they're ambiguous? Thanks for such a simple, easy to answer oh. question, um, which all of yours are, Mary. Um, so uh, let me put it this way. 
I, I've been redoing all of my what in the world are Presbyterian videos. And one of them was about the historic principles of church order, I believe. And one of those is that people of good faith can disagree and still be faithful. And so it is possible for two Christians, and this is what we as Presbyterians profess, that two Presbyterians can get together and have totally opposite views and still be faithful. Um, why? This is an act of humility, which is always the way we are to approach our theology, our understanding of scripture. And that is we are not God. And no matter how much we think we know fully the mind of God, we don't. That is the original sin, to become like God, knowing good and evil. And so, um, there, there was, and just my, and to show, I don't know, I may have talked about this at one point, but I was watching a, a video I found someplace on one of the neo-Calvinists. These people who have sort of resurrected Calvin and this, this guy, I don't remember his name, but he's one of the most famous, shows you how much I pay attention to it. Anyway, so he's having this, this he's, he had evidently spoken to a group of people and one of the people said, well, why does God create people that God knows God is gonna send to hell? Okay. Well, the, the guy answers, well, you know, I don't know the mind of God enough to know why God creates people that God's going to send to hell. All right. But what that doesn't say is the guy saying, well, I know the mind of God well enough to know that God does create people that God's going to send to hell. I just don't know why. Right. So it's like it, 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 it's it, he, he seems to say, well, I know the mind of the will of God enough to know that this happens. If you don't know this over here, you don't know this over here. So, so we as Presbyterians are, are called to struggle, to wrestle, to learn, um, and then to make decisions for, for ourselves. I mean, when we get to the pearly gates, God's not going to say, well, what did your pastor say? <laughs> God's going to go, well, why did you make that choice? Let's talk, right? It's, it's between ourselves and God. Brian. And didn't God help us with that? I think Jesus uh, simplified it down to two laws. <laughs> and we can follow both those laws and still disagree with our Christian brothers and sisters. Love your God with your whole heart and mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Second one, most difficult to follow. But, uh, you know, but I think that's it. If you just follow that, you don't have to worry about the rest of them. Because that incorporates well, but, the ten, yeah, or no? But uh, Jesus said, "I didn't come to do away with the law." Right, but, in, but the, that second one encompasses more than the ten commandments because those are all do nots. Well, no, no. The name, first half okay. it's it's a summary. Okay, well that's true. The first half it's right. some the first, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and right. strength. Or the first half of the of the table of the commandments. The second is the second half of the table. Okay. Um, because Jews, when when they talk about Torah are not going to say just don't steal. They're going to say you share with your neighbor. You know, the the Ten Commandments are only a tiny part of Torah. They're, they're that's just, what I'm saying. So, yeah, that second part about love your neighbor is yourself. Yeah, you, know, you wouldn't deny yourself something. So, you know, don't deny your neighbor. I mean, so right. I think it. it how I saw it, it expanded the Ten Commandments, but it was only really two that he's really saying. So if you do both of those, when you think about it, well, it, it sums up the law. It sums up all yeah, the law. Yeah, yeah. And that would be the eternal law. I think going back to Mary's yeah. question, if we want to look at what's eternal, those are the two components of the right. eternal law. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. But Mary, it's just, it's always because we're human and we're fallible and we are impacted by our cultures, by our religious traditions, uh, by our friends and family. You know, all of those things affect how we are going to understand scripture and how we're going to decide 
what are the right things to do. And, and so I, I, th I, I think the challenge is just uh, is okay. for us to do to do the best we can. Almost over, so I'd say 15 minutes or so. So yeah, Mary, go ahead. I guess my problem yeah. is okay. Stay back in about 15 minutes. I can accept okay. your thing I that we can disagree and yet be faithful. My problem becomes when the person I am talking to does not agree with that premise, but oh, agrees, right. but agrees <laughs> or stipulates that you are wrong and that mm. there is no room in any discussion for your thoughts. That's their problem and not yours. I'll tell them that. Yes. <laughs> yes. Just say, you know, my tradition, my faith tradition does not tell me that. So uh, you're free to believe as you want to believe, but I'm just not going to share that with you. It's, it is, it is an act of self-differentiation. Are you all familiar with that term self-differentiation? Mm -hmm. It, it is it is figuring out where I end and the other begins. Mm. It is to say, this is who I am. This is what I believe. This is why I believe it. And you're okay. I mean, you're fine. You know, you can believe anything you want because what you believe doesn't, unless you make laws and rules that are going to oppress me, mm -hmm. you know, doesn't impact what I believe, which is kind of what Daniel did, right? Daniel was self-differentiated. He said, here's who I am. I am a good Jew. This is what I do. I follow Torah. And, you know, you can do whatever you want. You can make the law of the Medes and Persians. You can throw me in a lion's den. That's your, that's your right. Notice he doesn't say, oh, king, you're wrong. He, he says, you know, that's the king's right to do that. And so he self-differentiates. So Mary, that would be, and that's a tough thing, right? When someone, especially when they come at us mm -hmm. with it. Um, I had a guy, we were waiting to get in on the 4th of July at it. Um, Henry Ford Village for their big fireworks show. Mm -hmm. And some guy behind me found out I was a Presbyterian minister. And he's like, why do you have homosexuals in your church? You know, I mean, he was like, ah. mm -hmm. and I was like, well, you know, I, nothing I say is going to change your mind, but mm -hmm. <laughs> that's who we are. That's what we believe. And I can give you reasons, but I know it's not going to change you. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I said, we'll just stand here and agree to disagree um, because that's, that's us. Right. As I say, I think Mary's got the same problem I have too. My, my sister's very fundamentalist, very judgmental, wants to save me all the time. I got to say that Jesus Christ, and we have this discussion all the time. I, I tell my sister, I love her, but you know, I'm not that judgmental. I, don't, I'm, I feel that that's heresy. You're going to believe you know how God's going to judge. So we have this discussion all the time. And when I tell her, you know, I say, I don't know what's going to happen. But I, so maybe we're all saved. And she mm -hmm. can't accept that. There's no mm -hmm. way can that be acceptable to her. And I don't mm -hmm. know, but but I think it's they're so judgmental that it gets under our skin at times. And oh, yeah. Was, and so mm -hmm. I just, you know, I, your advice was right. We have, you know, we, mm -hmm. I still love my sister, you know, I, uh, but, it, and I can still have that discussion with them. Some people you can't, but I right. know it sometimes falls on deaf ears, but I don't know, over the years, I've made, made a little bit of progress. We can at least discuss it. I love her as myself. And that's why right. we just have to go on, you know, uh, but it's yeah. tough. It's tough, and it, it can cause tough. families to break apart, you know. Yes. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. so. yeah, Val, just a second. I thought, it, Julie, did I okay. see your hand? Were you? No, okay, Val. Um, I think it was at the end of last week's video or the week before, and when you were doing your little Presbyterian minute type <laughs> thing, and you said that it, 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 I think I'm saying this correctly, that it's part of the Presbyterian 
a belief that what you believe is between you and God. Mm -hmm. And I loved that. I thought, because that, that really almost simplifies it in, for myself. I mean, you, again, you're not going to change the people out there who are so uh, right. sure and aggressive. But for my peace of mind, to know that what I believe is between me and God, and it really doesn't matter to, you know, what anyone else says or thinks. And I, I thought that was amazing and powerful and um yeah god so I, alone is lord of the conscience yes yeah yeah and god cannot buy i mean uh, no one can bind our consciences mm -hmm. yeah. right but that and and for calvin though when when he says these things and and our tradition says these things part of part of that goes with that though is why Bible study matters. It's yeah. why worship matters. It's why mm -hmm. preaching matters. It's why prayer matters. Mm -hmm. Because we are all supposed to be on a journey of self-discovery. We're all supposed to be on this journey of transformation, of discovery, of knowledge, of learning. It's why Calvin believed in public education. Because everyone ought to be able to read. Every child should be able to read because every child should be able to read the scriptures for themselves. So Calvin was big into education, which is why Presbyterians have been big into education. Uh, we don't want someone else interpreting the scriptures for us. We want to be able to read them and interpret them for ourselves. Uh, part of our tradition. And I didn't really mean to imply that, you know, you can have any crazy belief, but it kind of, it kind of, for me, filters out all that noise of, if you're Christian, you should believe this. If you're Christian, you should believe that. You know, with my own kind mm -hmm. of study and so forth, I can form my own ideas of, of what I believe, so. That means you, you on, on one level, are a good Calvinist, <laughs> you know, because, because Calvin was like, all of us need to form ultimately, you know, he had very distinct views on what people ought to believe. And sometimes he went over the edge mm -hmm. um, when he, like when he had Servetus burned at the stake. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, he, he would acknowledge that, that it's our task as individual believers to... Mm -hmm to study, learn, grow, and make our own choices. So, anything else before we close this morning? Anything else? Mary. Well, the very last verse says something about that. Um, Daniel was also um, in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. So yep. isn't, isn't Cyrus the Persian the one that let the is Israelites go back to Israel? Yes, okay. Cyrus is, I think I mentioned last week, yes, is the only Old Testament character who is named, who, who, who the term Messiah is associated with. But they don't have any stories about Daniel coming back to, um, back to Jerusalem or anything, so. Yeah, it's interesting, no, no, it's, it's interesting that um, you have to wait till chapter 10 to get any stories about Cyrus. We're going to jump back next week to some more stuff about Babylon. Um, but yeah, no, it doesn't have anything about Daniel coming home. Uh, Liz. As I was studying, I noticed somebody um, comparing the Daniel story with Jesus, how the yep. religious leaders were jealous and they conspired against him. And he was charged before Pilate and he tried to save him, but he ended up washing his hands. He couldn't do anything about it. Yes, the, which is why the early church loved the Daniel story, or the Daniel in the, in the lion's den story. It, it was the prototypical story, right? You, as you said, so Jesus was faithful. He's accused by those around him. He goes before Pilate. As you say, Pilate washed his hands. I can't do anything. I have to give him up. 
Now, Jesus actually mm -hmm. dies, which Daniel doesn't, but Jesus is put in, and notice that, that when they put him in the lion's den, they put a, a, stone. a stone, right? And then the king comes and rolls the stone away. So the stone is rolled away from Jesus. Jesus is alive. Daniel's alive. So it's this nice, and, and often on early churches, you would find paintings of Daniel in the lion's den um, on the walls because it was, it was such a great um, story that, that walked that. Yeah, Mary. Actually, I had read someplace that, um, that the lion is a symbol of resurrection too. So that like in, uh, like in Chartres Cathedral and some of those cathedrals, they'll have okay. lions symbolized because supposedly they've seen lions giving mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation to their cubs or something. And they, so they, they keep them alive. So I just think that's, if you're going to put that in there too. The okay. Resurrection and the lions. And... I hadn't heard that. That's mm -hmm. neat. What else? Anything else? All right. Um, who would like to close us in prayer this morning? Thank you, Brian. <laughs> Let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks and praise this morning for all the blessings we have received, for his right to do so. May we always stay on the path of knowing to whom we belong and to whom we serve. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Thank you. Thanks.